I'm Matt, uh, the Newville Human Scientist at Sector 13 AP, at the APS, and we're going to go over collecting XS data on our beamline. I'll, I'll give a description about the beamline in just a second. I'll start with that, um, but just for sort of some like ground rules. There's only like 15 of you, so if you need to speak, if you have a question, just go ahead and speak. You can also use the chat. I'll be watching the chat some, but mostly while we're not collecting data, because if I'm paying attention to the data, I'm not paying attention to the chat. If one of you wanted to volunteer to moderate the chat, that would be fine too, but that's okay. It's, I think, I think um, it's a small enough crowd and we have enough time that that's not really uh, a main problem. So I'm at the beam line. It's a little noisy here. I hope you can all hear me okay. And I'm gonna put my mask back on because we're required to wear masks if we're in a room with more than two people. And the beam line's a little complicated for that. So I'm gonna put my mask on for most of this session. And we're gonna do transmission XFs and then some fluorescence XFs at this beam line. So this beam line, um, so sector 13 at the UPS is run by the group called Geo Soil and Viral Cars. That's, this, that's at the center of, for advanced radiation sources at the University of Chicago. We run several beam lines here at the APS. At sector 13, we run sort of five stations, four simultaneously. We have a couple of them trade on trade on. This station runs uh, full time. 1390E is an X-ray microprobe. We make a beam typically that's one to five microns in size, and then use that for fluorescence mapping and for uh, Zane's excess micro work and also some extra diffraction uh, work with a micro beam as well. Um, for, we, really we really try to focus on doing micro zanes and XFs, so we've optimized the beamline for that. And we mostly work with, uh, since we're funded to, by NSF and a little bit of money from the Department of Energy, we do geosciences, we really focus on earth and environmental science. Uh, and a lot of our work is actually sort of deep earth uh, geochemistry. So how much oxygen is in the deep or, uh, or in other planets? So we're often studying uh, lavas, basaltic, basalts, glasses from deep earth or samples returned from mass emissions and, and similarly. We're just looking at some, uh, last week at some samples that were taken from the Hayabusa mission for this uh, samples, samples from, we get to collect samples from an asteroid. So that, that, that's sort of the scientific mission. And what we want to do to do those works is, is use a microbeam because the samples are heterogeneous and we're interested in the oxidation state of the planets in the deep earth um, on a micro scale. Uh, so we make a small beam and we use that for fluorescence and X-ray absorption. And again, a little bit of X-ray diffraction. So I think most of you have been to some beam lines to do some kind of work. It may not have been XS and it may not have been at the APS, but they're all pretty much the same, really. So I'll say that this is uh, approximately a normal beam line, uh, at least for the APS. So I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna change my view uh, here to be a larger, to be, to be uh, oh yeah, I think I did view anyway too. To be a larger view and then zoom in a bit. Um, the, re so the beamline controls computer. If, for, for any of you who would come to the beamline, the beamline controls computers are uh, have four monitors, and I'm sharing all four of those here with you right now. So in this view, you can see a camera that's in the station that we have on a on a hand tilt zoom. So the beam. So this is this this is the end station of the beamline. This beamline uses an undulator X-ray source. So I think that in the, in the lectures by Steve and maybe a little bit by Grant, there's a little bit of description of what an undulator is. Actually, in one of mine, there's a little bit of a description too. Steve mentioned yesterday that the, the sector that they're working on uh, building is a canted undulator, meaning there's two undulator beamlines separately in the same station or in the same beamline. We have that we have that in our sector as well. In fact, we're using one of the branches, one of the undulators. So this beam line here is ours, the one we're using today. But in this pipe back here, this sort of odd rectangular aluminum pipe behind everything is the other beam. 
So we're sort of a side station in that sense. We have this other beam going through and downstream of the station, past this wall, uh, there, there is uh, other work happening, both mostly high pressure work, but some also stuff in center phase diffraction. Uh, and I'll, I'll, we can talk about what else goes on in the sector as well. So this, this point here is where the beam enters our station. There's a little shutter here to prevent us from the x-rays when we're in the room. Uh, the x-rays come in here, there, there, it's this is evacuated and then there's a, a window here, some slits to define the beam size. So the, the beam here at this point is about 300 microns square. We already have a monochrometer and some mirrors upstream to select the energy we want and, uh, and to deflect the beam and to do a little bit of rejection of higher order harmonics that I think is in Steve's uh, presentations as well. Then we have some filters that we can drop in the beam. We won't be using those today, but one of those is a piece of lead that's a little, we call a shutter, that we can just turn the x-rays off uh, from hitting the sample without, without going into the station. And then here, this long tube here, this long rectangular tube is the ion chamber that I think Steve described in his lectures as well. That's just a gas. Here it's filled, here we have this entire volume filled with helium. We're using only helium, that's why it's so long. It's 200 millimeters long. The helium, the x-rays go in, some of the x-rays get absorbed or compton scattered by the helium, and that creates a current that we count, and that current is proportional to the energy of the x-ray, but also to the number of x-rays. So we use that to, to determine what the current hitting the sample is. Then after that, we have here in this clear box, we have mirrors that that both deflect and focus the beam. So these mirrors, if I can zoom in on that a little bit, uh, are flat pieces of silicon that are, are pitched at about three milliradians. They're actually they're pitched at three milliradians. Um, so that will deflect the beam. A mirror is a low pass filter, so that does some harmonic injection as well. Uh, you can see this piece of silicon here on this. I think if you can see my mouse, okay, it's it's here. And that's just resting on two bars. And because it's resting on two bars, it we can push down on it. So there's bars on the other bars on the top, and just inside of those bars that it's resting on, one bar here, one bar back here that you can barely see. Then these bars on the top push down and the the form the the piece of silicon, it's eight millimeters thick, it's 200 millimeters long. And so that's to make an ellipse. So you wanna make an ellipse because an ellipse, as you remember from high school geometry is, is the figure that will, that has two focal points. And if you're at one focal point and you bounce off the elliptical uh, surface, and, at the, and then reflect at the same angle, you'll go to the other focal point, no matter where on the ellipse you hit. So any X-ray that from a point source that's at the fo that's this one focal point that bounces off that mirror, anywhere on the mirror will go to the other focal point. So we're making this into an ellipse that is that has one focal point being 50 meters upstream, the X-ray source, the undulator source, and the other focal point being where our sample is, which is just 300 millimeters downstream. So it's a very asymmetric ellipse, but, but it's an ellipse. Actually, it's also bent to about a curvature of a kilometer or so. That's the size of the APS. So it's not bent very much to make that ellipse, but it's bent enough. We actually do that dynamically. I can show you that uh, later uh, or, or in a bit. Uh, we do that dynamically, but I also want to mention one other point in that, because you're, you're going to ask the question, well, if you take that beam and you press down on both of those bars, you don't make an ellipse, you make a parabola. And I would say, you're right. And that's why the mirror, as you can almost tell in this mirror, but you can easily, more easily see in the next mirror down, is a trapezoid, not a rectangle. That makes it better, a better approximation of the ellipse. So we're trying to make an ellipse, it's not perfect. In fact, the, 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 the amount by which that ellipse is not a perfect elliptical figure, is the main limitation in how well we can focus this beam. Uh, and for the APS upgrade, which I think I think was um, was 
discussed a little bit, we're going to have to work on how this mirror, especially, is is figured because over that beam, over, over that eight millimeters of or two hundred millimeters of eight millimeter thick silicon, the gravitational sag of that mirror is important for limiting how well we can focus in the vertical. So the so that, that mirror, that one flat mirror focuses in one direction, the vertical, and then there's another one just downstream of it that focuses in the horizontal. So that way we get a beam at our sample position here, uh, I guess I can see that a little bit, that is focused to a couple of square microns. Actually, I think I have it to about five microns right now. I'll talk about why I defocused it a little bit from our optimal um, position in, in, in a second. So there's there's where our sample sits. In fact, if I go down in what I'm sharing, if I can do that, um, maybe I can uh, move what I'm sharing to down here. That's an image of this of the microscope view of that same sample. So here we have this is the microscope. In fact, if I zoom out a little more, you can see the full. So there's a, a microscope an objective lens on a tube and a camera back here. And that's what, that's the other view we're seeing. So we have this view of, of the of the hutch, the big view of the hutch, and then a one millimeter field of view focusing in on the sample position. And from there, like I, like I showed, that is the beam on this sample, which is a cadmium tungstate phosphor. So this glows in the beam. That, so this blue, Mark is the beam on the sample on our cadmium tungstate sample. We also have, though, here um, at or zoom the other way, at then normal to the beam or normal to the beam at 90 degrees to the beam, and in the horizontal plane we have a detector that's our fluorescence detector that will measure the emission off the sample. So we use that for all fluorescence measurements. Most of the work we do at this beam line is just in fluorescence. Uh, Today we're going to be using transmission, which is a little weird because the transmission, we have an ion chamber downstream, it's just under this detector. So this is a detector that we use for X-ray diffraction um, when we do X-ray diffraction. And underneath that is, this, is another ion chamber filled with nitrogen that we'll use for transmission. Really, it's there, you just can't see it in this view. Um, if you could go in the hut, you'd see it easily. So then we have the sample then on this stage that we can manipulate around. Uh, so we're currently on this, this uh, little crystal here. I can move the sample stage up and down if I uh, do in, say, five millimeter steps. And you can see that the stage, uh, two millimeter steps, the stage goes up. And we're bouncing off of this is a different phosphor in the beam. Um, and in fact, so we're just, so at this point we're just seeing where the beam is so as, we're, as if we're getting set up. So we can tell where the beam is on the sample. And if I go back to showing you that that microscope image, that's now this, and I'll do the same thing where I'm just going to move these, uh, push on this to move this sample up and down, the crack in the in the phosphor, and one thing. For fluorescence work that, that we always show people is that that image is in focus, but that's focus defined by the optical microscope. It's at 45 degrees of the beam. The sample sits at 45 degrees. If I go in and out of focus, the sample moves right left because it's going in and out. It's just going in and out of focus. I'm moving the sample relative to relative to the focal plane of the microscope. So for that, <laughs> that the um, our knowledge of where the beam is in the horizontal is a little worse than in the vertical. You can also see that this, the beam does not look at all round. It's got this tail on the right side, on the left side. Um, that's also the downstream side, and it's the side through which the x-rays would penetrate deeply into this crystal. So the visible light we're seeing here is from like emission or fluorescence. Uh, it's, you know, it's fluorescence just in the blue light regime from this sample. Right now I'm at exactly 10.1 keV. If I go up in energy a little bit, I'm just going to walk the energy up. Um, and there, you almost see, if I go to 10, that's a 10,200. And that's 10,205. And that's 10,210. 
and that's 10 to 15. I'm just taking five volt steps across, across the tungsten L3 edge. So again, below, below the edge and above the edge. So as you've seen, uh, and now I've, got, I've, I've gone over the edge. So if I sit right here at 10 to 15 or so, that's 10 to 15. I should try 10 to 20. Um, that's right on top, that at 10 to 10 is right on top of the tungsten L3 white line. So that's where the absorption is the most. So there we're penetrating the least into this crystal. The crystal sitting at 45 degrees, so we have a long tail on the downstream side where the light is still entering the crystal, still going through the crystal, still being absorbed and still producing light out. So that's all an optical effect and a combination of what the penetration depth is for this sample. If I go down in it, again, if I go down in energy by, by 100 volts, that gets a much longer tail. Uh, so that, that's a, so the beam is actually where the sort of at the right end of that. And the beam is about five microns right now. Okay, so that's micro, that's our micro focused work. Um, and, and we use this and then this, uh, this microscope to just define points where we want to analyze. So right now that's the cadmium tungstate. state. I'm just going to move to the iron foil. Like I already defined, I've already defined this mission. I'm just going to say, go to that. Yes. And it's going to race off to, uh, if I go up and now show you this view, it's now on the iron foil. You can see the, the light that's the light through the microscope that's been reflected on the sample, that's the iron foil. That's the view of the iron foil at a millimeter scale bar. Actually, the scale bar there's 100 microns, that's about a millimeter field of view. And we're on the iron foil with our micro beam. Um, and if I go over here to the next panel over to the right, this is the, that's the fluorescence spectra that we see. Now, we're well above the we're well above the iron edge, and we're and it's pure iron. So we're seeing lots and lots of iron here. With this, you can select the K alpha K beta lines for the iron foil. But if I go just a little bit down from this to what's a, what is actually the aluminum frame of that sample. So let me go just to show you here. I'm now on. If I go over here, and I'm now on the aluminum frame. Go down and show you what that looks like zoomed in. That's that's the, the microscopic image of the aluminum frame. They were on the aluminum frame. And this is the fluorescence spectrum from the aluminum frame. The incident beam energy is 10 keV, and we see iron and copper and zinc. Actually, the detector could go in closer even if we were going to do more fluorescence analysis. So there we can see this is, I should say. This is on a log scale. If I put that on a linear scale and accumulate that for a while, then we see a couple of effects. We're still, oh, I should restart that. We see the elastic peak here at about 10 keV. We see a tail that's the Compton scattering tail. And then we see uh, the fluorescence for zinc and copper and iron, we see both iron K-alpha and K-beta from, from the aluminum foil. Actually, I think the aluminum foil, I think we're high enough up to the little bit of iron behind that aluminum. Um, we can see other trace metals as well. If we look at a, if we look on the log scale, we can see that there's titanium and chromium and some manganese as well. Common trace metals in aluminum. Okay, but that's all we're here for today. We're going to go back to the aluminum, we're going to go back to the iron foil position and we're going to collect uh, iron exile on, on so the, right if I go to this then the uh, fluorescence spectra is totally saturated we would not be able to measure this in fluorescence actually we'll measure this foil in fluorescence and transmission and we'll show how bad it is to measure this in uh, in fluorescence mode or, and why you don't measure uh, why you don't measure fluorescence for high concentration samples
Okay, so to do that, so, to, what we, so currently the X-ray energy is about, it's just about 10 keV. We don't have it, we have a 10, one. So we wanna move closer to the iron edge and then set up a scan to, to go across the iron edge, um, right? So to do that, we're gonna go use our data collection uh, program, which are down in the lower right portion of the screen. We have here both a combination of uh, uh, GUIs, GUI and a macro language uh, so that we can easily script, I'm just gonna rearrange it over here, so that we can easily rearrange and arrange uh, complex data collection. So I'm gonna, right now, I'm just gonna say, move to uh, edge. Uh, iron. So this will move, this will move a lot of things in the beam line. Right, so this, at this beam line, we're using an undulator, there's a monochrometer, silicon 111, and then we have mirrors to deflect the beam, and then a small source upstream of the, or in between the, the monochrometer and the end station, we have a small slit that we redefine the beam in the horizontal, a secondary source aperture. And that allows us to do a better job of focusing the horizontal. I, I don't want to belabor that point too much. I'm just going to, I'm not going to fool around with it too much today. Because uh, when we're done, I want to go back to do some other micro focus work this afternoon. So uh, I'm going to not sweat about that too much. And so I, I told it to move. And actually, I should show you up here on some of our display screens, I think you can see this, okay, um, that there's a, it's showing the energy is now 7200, there's an undulator energy, it's, it's off a little bit, it's off by about 1% um, from the monochrometer energy, that's sort of a, a well understood effect that's sort of specific to the APS, and we'll on the wheel. Yeah, that's how it is at the APS, um, and then these curves here that are, that are being shown are that the monochrometer has two crystals. A first crystal that's liquid nitrogen cooled that really sets the axis and the angle and really defines the energy. And then a second crystal that, that is parallel to it, so it deflects, so it reflects the beam back with a constant height offset of about 25 millimeters. And, but that also has two piezoelectric uh, crystals that we can use to steer the beam a little bit. So what that was, was doing was just working on steering the beam. I'm also going to uh, set up the ion chamber gains. Uh, I will talk about that in a little bit, but first I'm going to get it set. And then I'm going to show you what some of those things are. That little red button in the upper right uh, shows that I want to fix that. And it shows to me that I want to fix that. Going. Right. So then it's going to it's going to do some offset collection. So we have now this is reporting the flux of about one times ten to the twelve photons per second uh, in our in our spot size of a few microns at seven point two keV. One thing that you may need to be you may need to pay attention to, especially for transmission exaps, is that. When we measure transmission XFs or XFs with ion chambers, the ion chambers are very good at counting the number of X-rays in the in the ion chamber. They turn the current, the X-rays get absorbed. That creates a current. Some of the, there's an ion and an electron. The current, there's a voltage across the plates that sweeps out the carriers. That makes a current. Then we take that current, it's a low current, it's in the nanoamp range, or maybe around maybe microamps, um, and we want to amplify that and turn it into a voltage so that we can integrate it for some amount of time, let's just say a second, and the total voltage that we collect over that time, or the total current, tells us the number of x-rays, or is a number that's proportional to the number of x-rays. So to do that, there's lots of electronic amplification steps in the way, and because the signals are low and we want good measurements of the intensities, those amplifications have to be pretty linear in the amplification. That is, you take two volt, two volt, two, two, two milliamps and and uh, turn it into a, into a voltage, or take four milliamps and turn that into a voltage. It's got to be 
that, that ratio better be 2.00, like with a lot of zeros in it. Uh, so we want it to be lit. We want that conversion to be linear, but also the way those electronics work is that they have a finite range of output voltage. And so we have to worry about saturating those electronics. It's not the ion chamber itself, and it's not the that's not the X-rays, it's just the electronics that we need to be mindful of saturating. So we want a voltage on these current amplifiers that is in the range of one to five volts, typically. It's okay if it's a little below that. It's okay if it's, and usually they saturate it more like six or seven volts. There's volts rather than five. So I just like to keep it between one and five. It's usually quite possible to do that because they'll have internally their own ways of setting the gains. So Oftentimes you need to play with this. Um, and this is necessary for both amplifiers, especially because as we, when we do transmission XFs, we're going across the absorption edge and that the absorption will change by an order of magnitude. So we don't want it to be too low because then uh, uh, below the edge, because then it will be really low above the edge. And we don't want it to be too high because it'll be saturated and then we don't, won't know what our edge jump is. So, with a range of about one to five volts, we also want to be able to handle a drop of a factor of maybe five or 10. So we got to get it sorted in the right range. We have some, we, at RB line, we have some scripts that just sort of help you do this, but I just want to make sure that these are set up right. And I'll do this for every edge we do. And we'll do several, we'll do several edges. So here, uh, if I go down here, so, Actually, when I show you this, I want to show you the concepts, not so much what we do particularly at our beamline. Just to like keep this in mind that you might need to pay attention to this. It's also totally reasonable to say the beamline scientists should do this for you because they know the details of their system uh, on these particulars and the particulars change at each beamline. So for here, I know that I have this number I zero, I zero that's three, 10 something, something. I know that that means it's three volts. That's good. I'm happy with that. I1, we're above the edge, and that I1 is, is much less than two hundredths or two thousandths of a volt. That's probably too small. But I'm going to go below the edge. I'm just going to move the energy down. Um, in fact, I'll do that from here. I'll just say move energy, just so that it's clear what I'm doing. So I'm doing move energy to 7100. And that number when that number jumped up. That's the edge. In fact, that looks pretty good. So now that's like 1.7 volts. So I'm happy with that. I'm going to deliberately say collect the offsets because I'm, when we use these electronics for the ion chambers, there's a small offset so that we know that we collect zero. We know that uh, any bias or change in the application allows us to have a pot a positive signal when the current is off. So actually I closed the shutter and I saw that there was a positive number and now I'm going to subtract that number to get the real current. It makes a small effect, but actually it can be the difference between decent data and good data. Okay, so we're on the iron foil. I'm going to go back. I'm going to show you like this. Okay, we're on the iron foil. Uh, that's the iron foil. And if I move the, and the energy is 7,100. Uh, and if I now and the I1 is 1.7, 107, whereas the I0 is three. If I, and if I move to 7150, just above the edge, that number is going to drop dramatically to like 0.2. So it's that's that's the that's the drop in intensity across the edge. So now let's let's do an XF scan of that. So let's say we're going to do Iron, the nominal value in many books is listed as 7112. It's not right, but that's the nominal value. And we're going to do our classic XF scan of saying we're going to do steps across in the pre edge range. I'll make that be uh, 2.5 EV steps. Uh, and then in this danger region, we'll want to sample that better. So I'm going to actually do finer steps than 0.25. I'm going to do 2.1 EV steps. And then Above the edge, we'll go out for this. We'll just go out to like a K of like 12. We don't need to go super far out. Like we could do, we could go further out if we wanted to. Uh, let's go out to 13. And we'll just collect that. So that's ready to go. We're going to go, so we're going to take steps in 
energy that are about two, two and a half volts below the edge, a tenth of a volt across the edge, and then above the edge, we're going to take these steps in wave number as the way we sample the excess. So I'm going to start that, and then I'm going to look at the chat. I see that there's stuff in the chat, but I'm going to uh, 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 get this started first, and then I'll look at the chat. So what I'm just going to call this iron foil uh, XFs. I'll hit start scan. So when we scan at this, when we scan energy at this beam line, we're, we're moving the monochrometer energy. The monochrometer is a Bragg crystal. Uh, so actually we're, we're changing the Bragg angle or rotating the, the, this, this sample, the, the, we're rotating the monochrometer crystal. We know the lattice constant pretty well. So the six digits or so, so we know the energy that, that puts out. We also need, because we're taking a scan that goes 500 volts or so across the edge, we also need to move the undulator. So at this beam one, we're moving the undulator simultaneously to uh, while we're collecting the excess. And while that's going, so and we also move the energy continuously. So you can see here this energy. Maybe you can see it in the in the video. But that is not stopping. It's just going, and we're just sampling the we're just sampling the uh, intensity. Oh, and I didn't check what we were collecting. I knew we were collecting I1, but I didn't check what fluorescence lines we might be collecting. Here, but you can see this is I1 over I0, and we're just getting close to the edge, and that's going down. So typically, you would take the negative log of that. So if I show minus log of that, there's uh, energy mu minus log of uh, I1 over I as we get to the edge. OK, so now I'm going to go look at the chat. So if there's any questions on any of this, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go over this in more detail. Okay, so Adriana says some students have not been to the beam line yet. Well, okay, so if you have any questions about what's going on here, or we can talk about like the synchrotron as a whole, but um, I, I guess I'll come I'll come back to that. Uh, and Kincaid Graf says I sent a proposal in this piece of the beam line, but I've not been there yet. Okay. Uh, great. Well, I hope that I hope that happens soon. Uh, we're still expecting that that people will be mostly off-site during the fall. Um, okay. And then Jay says, Matt, would you give me some sample space and beam size information? Do you do the same setup for DAC? So basically, uh, okay. So for diamond anvil cells, right? So if I go, if I, so that's the that's the zanes. We're collecting the zanes there. And let me go back to this view here on our screen, um, and I'll zoom out a little bit. Uh, okay. You can see that, you, you could see, you could, actually you can see these holes. Those are one inch rounds or 25 millimeters. Um, and we have about 25 millimeters in travel in X and Y. Uh, this, this space here is tens of millimeters. So we can fit a diamond cell in, in this setup. So we have actually lots of travel in the vertical. We typically mount three to eight samples at a time, depending on how big the samples are, and can move between them. Uh, so it's not an infinite amount of range. We have hundreds of millimeters of travel in vertical and 25 or so in the, or in the across the beam. Across the beam. Uh, I'm going to go back to our view of the XFs uh, data. So that's now the iron foil XFs. And that's working pretty well. Okay, so there's a question from Kim Jin Han. I zero and I two are identical in size. Ah, ah. So right, that's a that's a good question. So at this be my no. And in general, no. It's good to do that. But so we have for I zero, we have um, our beam. Our beamline I zero chamber is 200 millimeters long, and it's always filled with helium. I go back to this view and zoom all the way out. I didn't, I didn't mention um, this beam path from all the way upstream to through the mirrors and with the ion chamber. There's a window on the end just downstream of here, a thin capped on window, thin plastic, and there's a capped on window uh, right at the right here where there's sort of some white, you sort of see some white electrical tape. There's, there's a thin 
Captain window there, and then the rest of this is in helium. In our beam line, we do we go down to the sulfur K edge, and as you know, mu is strongly energy dependent. Uh, e to the e to the minus three. So this is all in helium, so that we can get down to sulfur and get enough extra. In fact, the windows, the plastic windows that we have, are a significant fraction of the absorption uh, for sulfur X-rays. But we can do sulfur. Uh, we do regularly do sulfur. Just in there. Uh, but this is all in helium. The I1 chamber that we have is 100 millimeters long and it's filled with pure nitrogen. So they don't, they're not matched at all. Um, it's, I think that many observers would say it's better to have them matched. And at the EPS, it's just not that important to get a really good measurement of, of I0 because I0 is so huge. You always get a decent measure of I0. Um, it's good to have them matched for harmonic injection. But this setup, I know the harmonic rejection is done by mirrors upstream. And for most of the work at this beam line, the harmonic rejection is done by the upstream, not. So it doesn't need to be handled by the iron chambers themselves. So that's so that's our iron foil XS there. That looks pretty good. We can read that into XAS viewer um, and we'll see. Actually, let's read it into XAS viewer. Uh, see if it starts and runs here. Um, Um, and then there's a question from Manuel, are you planning to later do an example like this for a Herfie measurement? I am, so we, so I should say we do Herfie in our beamline, but we're not set up for that today and I'm not doing, I'm not going to do a Herfie measurement today. So, uh, uh, no, I'm not doing Herfie today. We'll do micro work um, instead. Okay, so XAS viewer is up and running, it's up here in the next window up and I'm going to read in that. Right, so we, we are set up to do Herfi on um, have a three analyzer system at the three line uh, XF school, iron foil. So we're going to read this in as, as minus log of I over one, I one, I one over I zero. Okay. And there's our spectrum. So if we, if we only went out to camp 13, we did a half a second before point. It gives the energy. Uh, at this point, I would typically do a cali energy calibration. It gives, it gives the energy of 7110.5. I think that's a little low. And I might, I might actually now look at this derivative carefully and reset it. Um, uh, so th I'm going to look at this and think about so the the right value really the right value there 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 is a right value and that right value is 7110.75 um and so i think this is a little low but not dramatically low i'm going to go to six i'm going to go to six and reset that so i'm going to say tomorrow Six. And I'm going to set that to 7.5. Yes, I'm setting it by 0 0.15 uh, electron volt. I'm going to reset that. And now I'm going to go, I'm just going to go do that scan again after recalibrating. Um, I'm just writing this down. So I'm going to do this six. Oh. That's not on screen for you. Let me let me just go check that. I'm going to do two things here. Um, I'm going to be ready to scan that again after recalibrating, but I'm also going to now under detectors select which ROIs we're going to collect. We had been doing calcium and vanadium. I'm just going to select that we'll also collect the iron K alpha fluorescence so that we get that in this spectrum as well. With that, I'm just going to show you that the iron. Um, I'm just going to hit start on this. That the iron fluorescence is totally unusable for fluorescence analysis. So that's going to start. Um, I'm going to go back to sharing now this screen. Um, when this goes, it does a little dance at the beginning of each scan. While it's taking a scan, I'll just go to this data set, which isn't bad. I just want to fix the energy definition. I'll just go to the XFs and see what the XFs put out. 
So that's the X apps for this. It's that's okay. I just I just guess at a at a background. There's the background. It's not too bad. Um, and we might do a Fourier transform of that. That looks okay. And we get a Fourier transform that looks like this for a K squared. That's this for BCC iron. That's what it looks like. Actually, for if you're doing metals, I'll say like there's this there's this uh, noticeable large peak uh, in the iron about 200 volts or about 100 volts above the edge. That's really indicative of it being BCC. But you know, if you're interested in metals. <laughs> Um, so again, we're doing the second foil. We're doing the foil again, just as an energy caliber. Um, this will go pretty quick. And we have other foils on here that we could we could set up. But I, what I might do is set up um, some of the manganese standards that were done, uh, that were made, some powder on tape manganese standards that were made in the previous schools. Um, right, so, so Adriana pointed out that, that right, Herky was done at Section 20. I, I forget what they were going to do Herky on, but, um, but they were going to do Herky today. And we, so again, Herky is, is really just a different way of measuring the fluorescence. It's a little bit more set up uh, and can be slower, but it's, it's uh, can give higher, but it gives, can give higher resolution. Uh, Zane spectrum. We do quite a bit of that now at this. You know. Yeah. Okay. So, if you have any other questions, and uh, we will keep going after this. I think we'll do. Um, I have some other foils mounted on here, but maybe in the interest of time, we should switch to manganese and measure a bunch of manganese compounds. Typically, in this school, you're making manganese samples, and I have a bunch mounted up. I, I'll show you that. Uh, those merits of that. Let's see. What else can I tell you about this blue line? Um, so, a couple, a couple of people. Okay, so Manuel asks uh, because the sample stage is motorized. And how Charles has many detectors. Uh, I have a sense that what I so so okay. So Manuel asks if there's an interest in, uh, for example, cryo cooling. And uh, yeah, um, the, the real for us the real issue for cryo cooling is not so much the where the other detectors are. That's that's an issue, um, but that we want to be able to see most of the samples that we do microbeam work on. So we have played around with some uh, cold stages and cryo stages and we've used them on occasion. We don't have a dedicated or really efficient setup cryo stage, um, but we're working on that. In fact, we were, we have money and have said that we're going to do that. So we will do that. Um, over the next couple of years, we'll have a, we'll work on a dedicated uh, setup for cryo. Now, there's there are questions about why. Okay, so you didn't ask about why one would, might want to do cryo, and then it's for both reducing the thermal thermal vibrations that go into signal square, but also for beam damage. Um, and both of those are important. Okay, so that iron foil is done. I'm going to go back up to the uh, to XAS viewer and just read read that second one in. Oh, and I apparently saved in Herfie mode one of those. Um, read that in, and now that's 0.7. So it's a 2 EV shift, 0.2. It's a 0.2 EV shift. I think that's significant, and I'm going to like plot those together. Yes, that's better. Um, that's better, and I think that's better enough. And if I show those normalized, uh, you can hardly tell they're different at all. But in fact, 7110.75 is the right answer. And what we do at this B line actually is we calibrate 
on iron foil, and then we run the other, other foils and we check that they're all right. So we don't, we, we won't recalibrate when we go to manganese. Manganese will be right. Manganese is very close. We don't, we wouldn't recalibrate if we went to um, even molybdenum. Uh, we know that the lattice constant is right. Well, we check that about once a year and it's never, it's never changed, it never changes. Okay, so I'm gonna change samples now and put in, uh, I will share my screen. So if I stop my share and go back to video mode, I don't know So I'm gonna put in a sample with all of these on there. It has a, a manganese piece, it's called, I don't know what it is, but it's called manganese ball, we run a lot. And then furnaceite, and then O, and then O2 and MN203. And then I have another sample in here that we'll do some micro, we'll see if we get micro beam uh, measurements on that. So I'm just going to go into the station and uh, and change that up. I will put this on, I will put this, I'm going to reshare my screen. Uh, Go over to here and zoom out. So you'll be able to watch me go in and uh, change the sample. So I'll be I'll be right back. So you should still be able to hear me okay. I'm in the, I'm in the station um, and I'm gonna take this mount off, set it aside, and then put this other mount on that's got our manganese powder on tape sample, manganese foil here and some powder on tape sample there. Um, and so then I'm going to uh, search the station. Uh, that sound might be familiar to any of you who have been at the APS. I'm going to close the door in the, for the station and then move over to doing some negative. So I'll zoom in on that. It should be very close because I just put those in the same place. So that's like where the, where the And this sample is black, so it's a little hard to focus on. I'm going to turn up the camera light and try autofocus. See if it works on this. It might. Um, it's not working. I think it's not vital that this sample be well focused. Uh, or transmission at the uh, It's a little weird that I can't get it into focus. Let me try to get that one. Up, turn the game up. Yeah, I'm running out of again. There we go. So that's like in, that's okay. So that here, if I share this down here, that's not close to in focus, close enough to be in focus on the manganese powder on tape sample. But now we're going to go back to doing the same thing with the ion chambers. So I'm going to I'm going to move to manganese. Well, it's very close, but I'm just going to do this move this way. Uh, 
because it's, it's sort of easier and will take into account many of the uh, settings that might need to be changed. Actually, it doesn't really matter if we're going from only a few hundred volts. But it does this check. So it's you can see up here in our intensity measurements, that it's doing this check of the intensities in our ion chamber. And we have a foil upstream as well. That's the red curve. Just to to show, just to see that the beam is optimizing going through all the little slits well. So it's just taking a little bit of time to do that. And now we can check our ion chamber currents. And the ion chamber for I0 is four volts. So I think that if I do our auto set, um, it'll drop that by two volts to two, I believe. And then I'll do the same thing. Uh, move just below the edge, 6,500. Okay. And then do, look at the same thing for, for, yeah, for I1. Now I1 is five, is, is five, or 05 there. And I want that to be larger. So I'm going to do the same command, but for the I1 chamber, just to make sure that the ion chamber gain is as good as it can be. So the sensitivity is right for, uh, for the manganese. And actually, it, w it went up to one volt, which is good enough. And now it's collecting the offsets automatically. And then we'll be ready to do that scan. So I'm just going to say we want to do manganese. So I'm going to just change the edge to MN. Um, and I'm also going to check that we're collecting the manganese fluorescence as well as the total output counts. And we can do the same scan just to, it's close enough in, in energy. We'll just do the same scan. I'll call this, uh, this is like manganese foil, but I always, so I'll call this manganese foil. It's not really metallic. Um, Something like that. Or maybe I'll switch to those. It's always, yeah, things for it. Uh, we can take this comment out and we'll hit start scan. And, we'll, and it will do the same thing. It will scan from minus 100 to minus 10, and two of these steps, 2.5 of these steps, and then minus 10 to 10 and 10 fold steps, and then out to K of 13 inverse angstrom. For, this, for the previous scan, I didn't show this. So I'm going to go back up to the XASP while, while that's starting. Um, we measured that foil in, I showed that measuring that foil in transmission. We also collect that foil in fluorescence. And so, oh, I should, I kind of checked it. I kind of checked that. We don't want to collect those in, a, it's collecting the refraction information. Uh, I want to read, read that in because we also collected the fluorescence data. So if this was fluorescence data, I would just get the sum of iron K alpha. That's the sum of all of the fluorescence channels. But that is the XAPS data that we, that we have for that. I just wanted to, and I, so doing that <coughs> fluorescence, I guess I could read that, but those two together, it's totally wrong to measure that in fluorescence. That's the fluorescence data. You can see that it peaks up much earlier and it's completely saturated. So the excess are just totally gone as I go. Uh, as I go up over the edge, it's totally useless. So on the sample that's this pure, you can't collect it in fluorescence. Really, if it's more than five away percent, it's dicey to collect it in fluorescence at all. Um, okay. This is going, actually, I'm going to show, I'm going to show the data that's being collected. This is, again, this manganese foil. And if you have any questions, let's see, are there any questions in the chat that I see? Um, how feasible is it to do measurements at high temperature, say 500 or 600 degrees? Uh, it's feasible to do that, Karen. Um, the development factors will get high. You need a, you need a furnace or a, a temperature stage that can do it, but, but it's totally reasonable. And 500 to 600 degrees C is not that high actually. Um, 
Well, you know, it depends on the sample. Some samples will burn at that temperature, and some samples will totally disintegrate. But for lots of uh, samples, it's fine to do that. Um, and there's a couple more questions from how about diamond cells. So I'm not going to talk about so. So I let's see. How asks if I'm going to talk about other diamond cells or large volume. Um, and uh, no, <laughs> this is it. This is this is called the XF school. Uh, the, the sector here, GSC cars does a lot of other earth science work, including work that's a high pressure. Um, if you're interested in that, you can contact me or somebody else who's uh, who's involved with that. But I'm not going to spend time on the XF school talking about the large volume. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so this foil, this is often what I see with this foil, is that it's not a very good sample. Um, you will see this sample in many beam lines, and it's not a, that's not a very good measurement of negative foil. Um, it's a poorly made sample. Um, it's a standard sample. You can buy this, from, and many beam lines will have this set of foils, just like I have here, and the negative one is totally junk. It's, um, I'm just going to say the manganese one here is, uh, yeah, complete junk. So that didn't work at all. That's that's uh, that's like some really copy XAPS data uh, measured if measured in transmission. That, that totally worked. And if we look at that in fluorescence, it's going to show the same thing. It's like the manganese K alpha. It's totally saturated and peaks up at lower energy because it sees the manganese. So that's, again, completely useless. Um, so let's go on to what's down below and see if any of these samples are any good uh, for transmission XF. So I'm just going to place over, so I'll show you, what I'm going to show, show, show you this view here. Uh, Down. Okay, so this is the sample we'll go down here. This sample is labeled MNO2. I I don't know much about this sample. I believe this was made for a previous course, and we'll just see if it's any good. Um, so in fact, we'll do the same thing. I'm going to go back down over here to uh, uh, measurements with the ion gen, we can check above and below the edge that we have a good, uh, so that's that's below the edge. Okay, well, I'll just do this, do the 6500. Six, I'm going to move below the edge and do the same thing where I automatically set the I1 amplifier and then uh, and then check above the edge what the edge step is. So it, it set the ion chamber and it, it uh, then it's collecting the offsets. I move up to 66. I'm going to have to put this back in the right row. Yeah, now it was at 2.5 and now it's at 9. So that's a good edge step. So let's just try that. This is, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is a common practice that I didn't do for the last sample, but I'm going to do for this. I'm going to go over here and just save this as go in this box and just type that this is MNO2. Okay? But just to save that position. And now I'm going to go back here and go to our XF scan, run the same XF scan, um, but just call this MNO2. And it's not perfectly in focus, that's okay. In fact, with a, with a beam that's five microns, it's sort of better to um, it's sort of better to leave the beam a little unfocused. Let's see, so 
couple more questions. Uh, and then Will says, is there a command library with the commands you're using? To do? Yes, there is. I'm typing them, but in fact, uh, in this we have, uh, you can add, there's add other commands. You can, all of these are commands that you can type in or some of them take parameters. You can build up a queue of these. In fact, with this data collection system, there's a command queue. So all of the scans that I've done here are actually all of the commands I've done, including that XOP scans are recorded here. Um, the stuff I did at this extent, the stuff I did overnight is here, going back a day or so uh, for all of all of the scans that were all of the commands that were done. And you can build up a big queue of these and run overnight. Yeah, anyway, and there's there's even a little bit of documentation. Um, slightly. For the, for the people, actually, for the people that come to our Pima, we also have some videos on this that, uh, and, and we go over all of this as, as we're starting. It, but this will this will vary for every beam line, so that's, um, I wouldn't get too focused on that. So again, we're looking at this in, in fluorescence, in red, and it's going up. And actually, we see this thing that is rarely talked about and is not uncommon. And that is, there's a little dip at the pre edge peaks in many samples that are not perfectly formed and for, and for beam lines that have um, a slight amount of harmonics. We shouldn't have very many harmonics at, at 6 to 80. But, um, so here's a little, so this is for MNO2 for pyrolusite. There's a little bit of a pre edge peak. These are the pre edge peaks, and now we're going up to the main edge. Um, again, for all of these samples. Let's see. Uh, when it comes to your knowledge of when the pre edge begins, do you remember the EV values from experience, or is there a database of these values? Uh, Oh, should I? I should have used it. Right? I didn't go far. I should have gone further up the edge and find steps. I think. I, I don't, I'm not in love with that scan. Um, I might do that scan again, going further up the edge and find a step. Um, for four plus, especially. Um, so, I uh, let's see. When it comes to your knowledge of when pre edge peaks begin, do you remember the EV value and experience, or is there a database? I think there's not really a great database of what the absolute edge energies are for the pre edge peaks. Um, and I sort of don't remember them all. I just recognize many of them. <laughs> uh, they're often, so the there are book values that will give the energy, the edge energies for each element. So manganese is typically listed at, at 6539 and iron is 7112. Those are not very accurate, especially in the last digit uh, for metal foils. They're sort of bare atom uh, calculations. They're not perfect, but they're also a good indication of where the pre-edge peaks will be in a metal oxide. Metal oxide will have the edge shifted um, Did I lose my share? I think I lost my share. Oh, I think what I lost was the V and C here. Let me just reconnect. Um, and see if that came up. There we go. Okay, we're back on. So there's a sample that we did at that position, and the x axis we measured is this. Not great. Oh, sorry, wait, I gotta show that. I'm not showing that yet, am I? Sorry. Okay. Now I'm showing that. You agree? Is everybody, let me know if you can't see that shared screen. <laughs> Um, uh, again, there's only 15 or so of you, so you know if you want to speak up and just ask questions, that's okay too. Uh, 
me just make sure that that is, I just want to make sure that that is being shared and you can see that. So there is uh, the excess we measured. I'm, not, I'm going to change some of the scan parameters a bit. Um, I'm going to go further up the edge. Um, and I might find another spot on the sample. One of the things for a powder on tape sample is that it's actually not perfectly uniform. So I'm going to just going to do another one of those. And then maybe we'll do a map of the sample. Um, we can also though, go measure uh, a couple more uh, other of the other samples, because we'll see that there's a big difference in them. It's just whether or not this X house is very good. Uh, if that's okay. Uh, Going. We'll try this one again. I also say for, for people doing something other than who, who like your research is to do something other than transmission XS, but these powder on tape samples are among the hardest things to do well, uh, especially on a micro focus line, but just in general, making these samples well is hard. And, uh, and then measuring them with this fussing around the ion chambers is challenging. For most of the work we do for fluorescence work, you have to worry about the saturating the fluorescence detector, but that's sort of easier to understand and follow. Uh, so you don't really worry too much about, or that's easier to that's easier to deal with. And doing these transmission measurements is often something that when people who come to RBL, we help them with do once or twice on these hard samples. We also know that these these uh, powder on tape samples are not very easily made well. Uh, so that's always kind of iffy about whether or not you're going to see get good data. These are the hard samples. Let's see, when, you, when I said the other sample is crap, can you put, okay, yeah, right. So let me read in that manganese, and there's just no, there's manganese foil. And in I one, I think it was just totally saturated. Or so in I one, we had this. That was the transmission. So there just wasn't very good excess there. That's what I mean by total crap. <laughs> Uh, and, and my experience with these, with the manganese foil samples, is that it's often really dicey. So here we're seeing the edge piece a little better, um, and the edge is quite shifted up because it's this is four plus manganese. So it's a little better, and we'll go do uh, another one of these, and then do a, I guess. Yeah, so I want to do a map of one of these to show how non-uniform it is. But then I want to do a map of, uh, of this other sample too. Uh, and, we'll, and then maybe do a, a, uh, a fluorescence measurement on that. So here we're starting now the, the uh, larger steps in the K space. But that's looking better. And it's also looking like what I remember four plus oxide looks like. But for sure, lots of places will do um, uh, the manganese oxides reasonably well. And you'll see the, you'll see these data. Uh, Jay asks, can you give us tips to make a good sample? Right, so for okay, so so for excess measurements in general. You measure the sample you have. Depends on the systems you're looking at. For transmission excess of concentrated samples, like these powder, like these simple oxide powders, these are the hardest to make because for manganese oxide, you want a sample that's one absorption length thick or so. That's 10 microns. You want a sample that's uniform across the beam of, of a thickness that's of about 10 microns. And that's really hard to do because the, the powder size of a manganese oxide powder or any metal oxide powder is at the 
five to 50 micron level. You have to grind the sample pretty well to get it below five microns, unless it's already a nanomaterial. And many metal oxides don't make good nanomaterials. They stay at five microns or so, which is about one of broken ones. So you're left with samples that are uh, little rocks of about absor one absorption length, and you want to make that into a sample that's very uniform. So you can use this powder on tape method. What that really does is, is preferentially keeps the, the smallest sample sticking to the glue of the tape and getting rid of the biggest, the most absorbing samples. And then you stack them up so you make an absorption length or so. You can also press into a pellet when you press into a pellet, you can get a very uniform sample. You can well, mix a sample, mix it well, so you have a well-mixed sample, and then you can press it into a pellet. That's fine, but it's also good to try to remove the biggest particles. You can try to sieve the, the sample, but even a 400 mesh sieve, the spacing between the wires in a 400 mesh sieve are, is 37 microns. So it's, it's not good enough to really do a perfect job. It does, of course, preferentially keep the smallest stuff and take out anything that's really egregiously large. So these are hard to make. These, so th this a manganese oxide sample is about the hardest thing to make. Now, depending on what you're studying, your samples may be fine because they may be a low concentration where a, a uniform sample in fluorescence is a fine sample to use. So then it's it's not a problem at all. Okay, so that one's done. I'm going to go down. Let's do one. Let's do one more. Um, I don't want to keep. I, so there's also a question like, how long you guys want to stay here? I'm fine with going for longer. Um, I'm, I'm fine with going for longer, actually. Uh, okay, so that's manganese. That's MnO. Let's try to get that up. So if I go over here, let me just show you this. Now we're, on, now we're on another sample that's the manganese oxide, uh, and then, oh, I don't know, I, again, like, I don't recall where all of these samples came from, so I'm just going to check, do the same thing, where I check the above and below. That's below the edge, that's not so bad, I'm going to go above the edge, that's like one volt below the edge and it drops. Okay, so I'm just gonna, that seems like it's good enough. I'm just gonna run that scan. Um, that's just MNO. And then maybe I'll map one of these. Um, it's going, it always takes a little dance at the beginning. Um, right, so, I, so yeah, so we often show these transmission XAPS data or the foils in an XAPS school, it's, and it's the least, it's often the least relevant, and it's, and it's actually the hardest samples to make. Okay, so this one's going. Right, so we're here on this sample. We're going to go, I guess, if I show the, uh, the sample stage here, put the sample in, and the fluorescent spectrum was behind this. <laughs> there's a lot of screens. Uh, this is the fluorescent spectrum. Actually, there's an interesting effect you can almost see here. We're just below the edge. You can see the manganese, but it's sort of shifted and lower in energy. And then this sample also has actual titanium in it. I think that titanium is from the tape. The um, magic tape um, will often have titanium in it as the whitening agent for the tape. Okay, but we're going, we're going to see the pre edge peaks. Um, yeah, now we're just starting to go up the edge. If I select, if I show what the manganese counts are in the fluorescence, uh, if I click in there, the manganese counts are now going up. It's a, a, million counts per second or so, and at the edge, you see 
you see the CRA now have a little bit of a pH peak. Actually, it's probably in the, about the same energy, but in a different spot, or different relative main edge. Uh, and you see the edge. Yeah. So this is transmission XFs, and I think that, like, I might say that that's enough transmission XFs. It's going to, it's going to be the. It's good to have the foils or some manganese oxides measured well. Um, it's also fine to measure them someplace else and do energy calibration for the for those processes. Right, and that's looking that's looking better for MNO. Uh, and it's quite different. We'll read in, we'll read in both of those and just show them the difference. I, I think you all get that already. Um, maybe I'll maybe I'll go to a, a scan of of a, a map of one. Of, let's go let's go down to the sample and do a map of the sample. Uh, that's more. I think that's more interesting to the next. Any questions? This is a fine time. We're running, so we, we it's uh, also fine to make requests or uh, of other samples you would want to see. So this was almost done. I'm going to go read in the other one and then I'll read in this one. Um, Back to the rest of the here. And we will be, we get the MNO, the O2 is better, I think. Still not great, but I'm just going to go say that that's good enough. Uh, And so those are pretty different for, you know, two plus and four plus oxide. I think for the I think for the MNO we're going to get decent XF. Yeah, so that's the XF for MNO. For MNO 203, that's the XF too. So we plot those two together. Those are the two different XFs for. I haven't played around with like trying to get the background subtraction for the high case stuff a little, you know. But those are decent. Uh, I think um, XF for both of those. Let's look at the chi of R. For those two, I think there's a little bit of background subtraction we would want to fix up for the MNO2, but it's, but it's basically right. And we see that, that, in fact, the intensities are about the same, um, just the peak positions are different. So for the MNO2, we see the very tight oxygen bond. Just, uh, so this one, let's plot the two chi of R over here. Yeah, I don't know what we're trying to do. I think I might want to go up the edge a bit. Anyway, <laughs> that's the MNO bond. That's the short MNO bond and the uh, MN uh, MNO two plus 
has this noticeably larger because it's also a, a, a rock salt structure. Okay, so that's that I think is is good for that. That's that's how you measure transmission excess on the uh, on the uh, powder on tape samples, which are usually decent measures of of uh, the Decent measures of, of the total oxidation state. I'm just going to pull the detector back a little bit just so you can see. I'll push it back in for doing the analysis. We have this other sample here, and we're going to go try to find an. I don't remember. Um, this is a garnet, and I think it's got a lot of iron in it. So I'm going to leave the intensity just below iron and see if I can get this in focus. And we'll make a little fluorescence map. Yeah, so this is much more typical of the work we do at the theme line. So if I show you now in the microscope field view, that's our garnet sample. And then let's go to the fluorescence detector, which was up here. I'm going to use what I have in mind. Um, and I got to move the detector back in. OK, I'm going to leave it there. So this is the fluorescence spectra we're seeing on this sample. We see uh, a lot of potassium, potentially interesting, titanium, chromium, and some manganese. I'm going to move the energy up in, actually, I think you can see this now over here at 6,600. If I just walk that up towards iron, uh, let the everything catch up. There is, I'll restart there. There's the iron K alpha, and I'm just below the edge. If I go above the edge, I get this. So we're really saturating on iron when we go above the iron edge. So I'm going to do a trick that we often do. Uh, I'm going to just sit below, just below the iron edge. We'll see iron. We'll also see manganese reasonably well. Uh, I'll just turn that down a little bit more. We can see iron. Here, this peak here, yeah, I'll leave it over here. Okay, better. Uh, and we'll see the other elements as well. And if I now, if I like, I, I'll tell you that I'm doing this, but you can't see it. So I'm just going to move the sample around uh, in the beam. You'll see that as I do that, the element, the different elements uh, move around. Huge peak there. Okay, um, so I'm going to set up then uh, a, 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 a raster. So let me go back. Okay, so that's doing that. And what I was doing for that was moving the sample around like in steps, like 100, 100 electro or 100 micron steps. So there's this thing here. I'm going to go just down here and look at that. Yeah. OK, so good. So what I'm going to do is set up a map. We're going to start at the position, and we're just going to go in 5 volt increments and raster the sample back and forth and collect the full fluorescence spectrum, the full fluorescence spectrum. So to do that, I'm going to go over here to our, our epic scan setup window and just say that I want to do a map that's also going to say uh, 250 microns, so a pretty small. Maybe I'll make it. Yeah, that's fine. It's, it's, it'll be a half a millimeter square, a two micron resolution. In fact, I'll make it 500 by five. I'll, I'll make it a little bigger. 
to make it five micron steps because I think I have the beam bigger than that. So I'm going to make it a larger now. Uh, let's make it big. Let's make it a full millimeter square, but at five micron resolution or four micron resolution because I think the beam is about that size. So this will take 15 minutes. And I'm, I'm just going to call this Garnet Map. And I'm just going to hit start on that. And I'll show you what, so this is just going to start. And I should have And I'm going to go over here and show you the sample rastering back and forth. In fact, we're just off the sample right now. So it's hard to tell because because the thing is moving so fast that it's rastering back and forth, going up and down, or going left and right, and then taking a step going back. So this will go for a little while. Uh, it'll, this will take 15 minutes or so. So this is a fine time to be asking questions about lots of things. While this is going, I'm going to read in this map. Uh, with another program uh, to do the map display. Um, ah, there was a question if I could zoom in on the PHP. So yeah, let me go, let me, let me get this started. I'm going to read in, I'm going to start processing this map. Um, map, yes. But then I'll go back to the PHPs. So if I bring, in fact, I'll bring those windows down into here. This is actually a viewer. And if I look at the normal stuff there, those two. I just look at the PHPs here. So for these data sets, I'm not in love with this, this little, there's this little feature that we often see. Um, there's a little drop here, but these are the PHPs. So for this, and those two. Uh, we have much better data on pre edge peaks. I, I have a, an example in one of the demos I do where I use this for doing pre edge peak fitting of those. Um, and those are better pre edge peaks. So the iron foil, actually, if you look at that, there's not a pre edge peak, that's the edge. Um, and, and this energy, these energies at 7110 to 7115 are where. You can almost see here, but in here, are where the pre edge peaks are in iron oxides. Because it's the same transition, it's still actually that's where the Fermi level is for iron at 7110 to 7111. Um, and when you add the, the P oxygen ligands, actually, what happens is that the states above it empty out. Those are the anti bonding, the, thing, the samples uh, are insulated, right? Uh, an oxide is insulated. Ah. So what really happens is the, the peaks is that you lose this step, or that pushes out to higher energy, and those are left as pre-edge peaks that are still at the atomic levels for the. So I, so Adriana, you asked about pre-edge peaks, and I don't know if that answers your question at all. <laughs> so let me know if, if that's if that's uh, not sufficient. Let me know. Um, but those are the so those are the differences in 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 uh, the edges for MNO and MNO O2. Okay, well, if that's sufficient, I'm going to uh, uh, and uh, go back to this map. I was sh let me see if I can just show you that the thing is still rastering back and forth. Samples going back and forth. And now if I sh go in to our map view and read in, I can read in that data while it's being collected. So I'm just going to read that in and I can say, let's show the counts in manganese in that map. And that's our manganese image. Um, I'm going to add more rows, more data been collected since we made that. This this program both shows the data, but also helps build 
the data from the raw map, raw data that's collected. So with that, so that's now our that's now our map. That's for manganese. And if we look at well, we also collected iron, but not so well. So I'll go I'll make a three color map where we put say iron in red, because iron should always be in red. Um, and manganese in green, because manganese is photosynthesis, so you can remember that. And maybe calcium, which is pretty big in this. And, and there now we have a map that has iron that we see and and manganese as well as uh, calcium. And for, for each of these points in this map, I can say, pick an area for X or F spectrum. And if I draw a little blob, we take that blob, that's the X or F spectrum for that point. And there, you see that there's sort of the same display like thing. There's plenty of manganese, plenty of iron, and plenty of calcium down here, as well as actually titanium. So let's go look at the titanium map, because that could be interesting too. Um, it's just a question of, oh, there's titanium and blue there, and they're nice purple there. Amazing. So, this is, I, I always find this garden example, it's one of our standards that we just have lying around. I always find this one to have interesting things happening, including for the rare earth elements. So, there's, so there's enough manganese there that we can do the manganese x ops on one of these spots. Um, so, to do that, in fact, what we would often do, actually, I'm, I'm not sure what this is. In the, Thing here is plenty of, plenty of titanium there. Look at that. So maybe, yeah, so yeah, a titanium phase, and then next to it, the calcium phase. So, yeah, amazing. Um, So we're about halfway through this map. So what, what we often do with that is we would select a few points to do manganese zanes at. So I might just say, let's just select this point. So I'm just going to say this point right here, I'm clicking here. I'm just going to call this garnet one. And just hit return there. And then I'll do up here uh, garnet two. So click there. And you can see a little white diamond shows up where that spot was saying because also then in our list of so this is this is definitely only at rv line or maybe there's a few like nsls too that might have no i won't uh so these also go into our list of sample positions so then i can just set up a queue to do the manganese zanes at those points um, these so we might just do that that might be sufficient to so say We've made a map. The map is kind of like cool and interesting. Um, and if you look at where it's, yeah, <laughs> just going across that little piece there. Okay. Um, if you have any questions about any of this stuff, uh, um, you know, let me know. The chat works, but there's, I, I think there's only 12 of you now, so we could just be talking if you want. That's fine too. Um, and I'm really trying to wrap this up because I know, uh, I think you guys were expecting this to be about an hour and a half and we're right at an hour and a half. Um, uh, it's fine with me to go longer, but you know, I don't want to keep you all. Uh, Maybe you're, maybe it's late evening for you in Europe and uh, in the middle of the night, if, if any of you are from Asia, I doubt, I doubt anyone from Asia is paying attention. Uh, I could just, I could just describe, define a third spot here. So I know that, so I know from other, other work on these garments that, um, this banding here is really interesting. It also shows in other elements that are higher energy that we're not looking at right now. But so for these garnets, you know, there's a lot of really interesting things happening. But for now, I would just say we have those three spots. Um, so um, 
And what we would do is say there's garnets plots one, two, and three. And I'm going to go back over. So I'm just going to pretend that we're like close to done with that. So back to XF scans. That's our manganese XF scan. I'm just going to make sure that that's saved as uh, manganese XF. Oh, yes. And then I'm going to double check that we're collecting the manganese fluorescence because we're going to want to measure this in fluorescence. We're not going to get any uh, transmission through this. And the manganese is pretty low intensity, low concentration. So now I'm going to go to commands and say add position commands. So there's the three positions for garnet. I'm going to select none. I'm going to select these three. And I'm going to say, let's do the XF scan called manganese XF. Now, again, if you were coming to our beamline and you wanted to learn how to do this, we would show you this. I'm just going to, this, for, from this point of view, I'm just showing you that we're just going to queue up to do the scan. We're going to tell it to go to those positions by name and tell it to do the manganese XF by name. And now I'm going to kill this map and just start these. Um, I think we're still going to go back. Let me read in more rows. Yeah, so that it's just a big blob. We're good. So I'll just I'll just abort this map. Um, abort this. That's good enough. We collected something like 200 by 250. And now I'll just I'll just say in this command to just submit this command, and it will go off. And now if I show the IDs. Make sure it's showing the plot window. And now we want to not look at the, the transmission, but the fluorescence, the, the manganese K alpha fluorescence as we go across the edge. Now, so now we're collecting manganese K alpha. For the, so we're using a detector that has seven simultaneous elements. We're collecting all of them at the same time. We're doing the dead time corrections, which, if that was talked about, is uh, uh, our included here. And, and we're going, now going up the edge, so we're collecting the fluorescence uh, zanes at spot one there. And the, the, the counts were reasonably high, but there was a definitely a, a, an edge. And if we see an edge, if we see a peak in the fluorescence spectrum, we can generally measure the, the, uh, the edge. So there's a question. Um, okay, told me to head off. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for coming. Uh, and then the question is: This technique available to combine with time resolution, for example, as a reaction procedure? So, um, for time resolution, it, it's a question. It's only a question of what time scale you need. Uh, so, as you can see, we're doing these scans in a couple of taking a couple of minutes. So if you were doing some reaction that took a couple of minutes, then it would be no problem at all to do that. And so many people will do battery cycling um, as a function of as a, you know, battery cycling and measure, looking at the oxidation state of the, of the cation as your uh, And then um, for, for um, If you need to go faster or very fast dynamic, say at the microsecond or so, many people will use pump probe techniques. So they'll pump uh, with, a, with a, a laser and then use a time delay after that. And then you can time the signal. We don't do any of that at this beam line, but there are beam lines that are dedicated to doing those kinds of measurements. So for this, there are these pre edge peaks here, uh, but it's you can almost see. Um, that's interesting. And we'll read this. When this one's done, we'll read this in. They're probably all the same on this garnet because it was like one large crystal with the kind of difference in a concentration gradient, I think. Um, and OK, th there's a question from Eric <laughs> Adriana. What, uh, what garnet is that? Uh, yeah, I should know that. And I can't remember. And Tony is out today. Tony Lanzarotti, my beam line scientist my collaborator, and he knows he's, he's um, 
it's a yttrium bearing garnet. Um, and I, mostly it's interesting for its rare earth composition. Um, I don't know the, I don't need the details of this one. Uh, but it shows this amazing banding in, in, uh, in well, at least in the yttrium that we're not looking at here. And it, and it just shows like some heterogeneity that's interesting and, and it's got some. And so that's tip, sort of typical fluorescence X out. So again, we're going kind of fast on this and the count rate is, uh, I guess each detector, if I show this, this is a sum of the detectors. Each detector is displaying about 100,000 counts per second of manganese, at least on this spot. So, and we've got seven going simultaneously. So that's sort of a noise level that's a little on the typical side, but you can also see it's pretty reduced. It's going to be, um, well, well, let me read that in with the, uh, with the XAS viewer, the bring in XAS viewer over here. That's our two plus and four plus. Um, and you can see it's even got a little bit of this thing right at 70. So this is going to finish. We're only doing one scan. It's like for fluorescence, we might want to do multiple scans at the time. Uh, all, this is just going to go on to the second point that we saved and then go do that one. Um, and we probably, it's probably overkill to go out to KF13 and the Sangstroms on this, but we're just doing it. In fact, we went out to 13 and the Sangstroms, and there we see this little thing there, which is almost fascinating. And anybody, anybody, anybody? That's the iron edge. <laughs> a ton of iron in the sample, and we hit the iron edge. So if I really read that one in, um, I can show you how I can show you how I'm reading that in. I'm reading that in as some of the okay, alpha and not taking the log. And we see that there's the iron K edge. And so when I do that, we get this picture. So I'm just gonna I can cut this off, but I can say uh, de-glitch the data and remove all energies. I pick an energy here. Remove energies above seven. Remove that range. And there's the new data. I'm just going to save overwrite this. And now I've just done. So that was just the data. That was the negatives. Data with the removing the. The points near the uh, from the iron edge, and now now you can see we have the two plus oxide, the four plus oxide, and our garnet spectra. If I look, plot that with the two plus, you can see it's not the same as MNO, but it's two plus, and it's not four plus. And you can also believe that that's also not two plus. Anyway, that's a uh, that's fluorescence exiles. And we got another one going, and it's going to look pretty similar. I hope. Actually, let's look at, let's zoom in on the pre there. Actually, is that similar? Is it different? That would be really awesome if we, if we were able to get two separate data points. They are different, aren't they? But that was at 6,400 there, and this one, I'm not trying to get it on the same scale. Maybe there's a bit. Yeah, they're the same. <laughs> okay. That would, I was just being hopeful that we would find differences in these, but probably not. Okay. Um, so we did transmission excess on the iron foil, and we talked about the beam line a little bit. Um, and we talked about, we did the powder on tape on the manganese oxide powders. We did a fluorescence map um, with on this garnet and we did some iron, we did some manganese fluorescence XFs. So how you guys feel about having a beamline and and, uh, and collecting data? Does this look like something that you uh, want to do, could do, or are there still questions you have about what you would want to do to make your research work for this.